Um, we have adoption of the agenda, and there's it's we're going to amend it to replace pages 119 to 128 with some updated copies of bylaw 1888, which regards the voting. And Shelley can give us a little explanation if you like. Um, yes, sure. Um, thanks to Twyla for pointing out some omissions, errors, inconsistencies, and typos in my first copy of the draft bylaw. So I. I've updated it to correct for that. Um, the definition of voting book was blank in the original bylaw. Um, there were some references to a uh, presiding election official in the bylaw, and uh, in the town of Comox here, as we only have one voting place, we don't use a presiding election official, so that was changed to chief election officer. Um, some inconsistencies with respect to um, just the, the labeling of the legislation, so I updated that, the local government act. And um, there was also a procedure at the end that, that discussed using a spreadsheet to tally the election, um, the end election results, um, which was inconsistent in a couple of different provisions, and I've, I've actually removed those two. So, uh, not to say that we, we can't use a spreadsheet, but just so that it's not prescribed in all the Okay, so everybody, everybody gets that. Okay, fair enough. So, um, we do have a public hearing coming at 7 o'clock tonight, so we'll try and keep things rolling along. So, with that, uh, motion to adopt the agenda. So moved, yes, uh, second. And, okay, let's move along to delegations. Uh, first delegation, or the only delegation, is Alan Morrison and Jim Matthews regarding Filbert Heritage Lodge and Park Society with plans to construct a timber frame pavilion. So, gentlemen, you have ten minutes. Thank you. I'll, the, um, let's put it out here so I can just... Well, we just gotta, you go. Show can't me. block the camera. Ah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they say sometimes we have a blank look on our face. <laughs> <laughs>
other years would see perhaps uh, more trellis work, uh, perhaps an L shape, perhaps a swept. Uh, if we start this September 30th, it would probably be done in five weeks before the weather turns and, and ready for use for the next year. Uh, it would extend the uh, season of the kitchen by uh, two or three weeks on each side of the, both in the spring and in the fall, at the end of the fall, as well as being used for everything else that happens at the Filbert Park. Uh, weddings, uh, our, our Filbert Festival, uh, the grand ceremony that just happened last week, any event, shellfish festival, this will be a, a well-utilized um, and signature um, building in the heritage style of the, the rest of the buildings at the, at the lodge. Um, so I'll stop there, unless there's any questions. Councilor Grant. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. This is exciting, it's very it good. Um, experience teaches me that finding funding is always a challenge. Just, and you mentioned you have your funding in order. What is the source of this Okay, funding? that's a very good question. First of all, we have internal funds. We're seeing our uh, financial advisor uh, within the, the month. Uh, we're tapping 25000 which uh, by our bylaws we can do for projects like this. We're going to make this the poster child of the Philbrook Festival. In other words, the tickets, you know, the thermometer. It's, it's exactly what happened with the, the Comox Watery stage. Um, grants, there'll be grant application. Um, but any fundraiser, the concerts, Filbert Festival itself, any fundraiser that happens at the Filbert in the next six months will have this as the target. Um, there is, um, the price is about, it's about half the size of the stage that was built in 2014, and of course half the cost. So that's something, that even though it's been on our books in the past for two years, it was always contingent upon finances. You have to be able to pay for it, mm -hmm. and that is now in the works. Um, is that That's good. So we'll all be heading towards Gilbert. This they, they, I certainly <laughs> hope so. I buy a raffle ticket. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Buy two raffles. Yes, guaranteed to win the money or double your money back. That's what's good. Yes. Um, Ellen, just refresh my memory. I know originally when we were talking about this, the thought was to do it as a phased project, but it sounds like you want to do it all ah, at once. That was the original. We were going to get it, and had we started September last yeah. year, we would have done all the concrete and flat work, and then come back in the spring for the superstructure, the, the wood. Yeah. Now, um, it behooves us to do it all in one swoop, uh, so that it is ready for next spring. Uh, the contractor would be on board, the money's, the funding's on board, so uh, we're waiting for the Apple Press, the last event on September 23rd. This would start the week following September 30th. Good, good questions, Much more counseling you. Oh, go ahead. Well, I, was just, I was just saying that it is much more effective to do it all in one phase rather than split it up into two. Yeah, so, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Hugh, go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks for the presentation. I, I, I'm really excited about the extension of the season, and I've often thought, and I will say now, that uh, I'm stepping down from council. One of the disappointments is is not doing a connective walkway to the Philbert from the marina uh, to perhaps enhance the uh, possibility of, of extending the season for the tea house or something like that. But I really uh, uh, think that would be great and an attraction in itself. And perhaps the future goal of council can be to make a connective walkway that could uh, enhance uh, the visitors there as well as seeing some of the rest of the town as they do a loop around there. And perhaps this might be a, a, a foster uh, looking at something like that. Yeah, and the catalyst. Yeah. Further incentive, yeah. yeah. Well, I know the uh, Downtown Business Association does have their walking guide out in Filbert Lodges included in many of those walks. Mm -hmm. Um, to go along the waterfront is a little more, yeah. a little more in depth for us. Yeah. <laughs> so we, that, that's been the goal for 50 years now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very well, nice. I'll get down to Amazon. Yeah, one day. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks very much. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for allowing us. Exciting. Yeah. Wonderful tea house too. Yeah. Well, the operator of the tea house is very excited because she's directly involved. Okay, thank you. All right. Welcome. Thanks, Alan. So we'll move
move on to the minutes of the meeting and regular council minute meeting minute, meeting minutes for Wednesday, uh, May 16th for approval. So moved. Second. And second and discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor? And we will move down to unfinished business, the management report for receipt. Move receipt. And Councillor Swift. <laughs> what would well, you like to ask? Me, it's funny you should call upon me, but I don't think there's anybody. Oh, hey, Martin. Um, I am curious now. We, I know we're going to have the public consultation. I'm talking about the Northeast mm -hmm. management. Well, stormwater management. So what, did, what are the next steps now with the... the um, I believe the um, time limit for people to submit comments has come to an end, so I anticipate that we should be getting the uh, report back from... Okay, so we're waiting for the report from Michael Haney? Yes. Okay. With the final report, uh, incorporating the concept of the progress and how they come to Do you have any sense of how much uh, interest there was in commenting? Or? There was interest in, in the plan itself. Um, the um, interest seemed to be focused more in terms of uh, electoral area B uh, and in terms of paint. Stormwater facilities that need to be constructed within that area. And they're going through a process right now to see where these are going to be to the Thank you. Thank you. Marvin, when would the, you anticipate that report coming back to Council, approximately? Um, we're now in June, so I would say. Realistically, you're probably not looking at that report coming back. Earliest would be August, um, but everybody's there in the middle of the building season, and uh, there's also some vacation so that's in September. And Barbara. Yes, and, and just more for a memory refresh, the Matalan Trust, uh, when is it going back to uh, court? Does anyone have that in the, in the tips? July, was it? Do I remember July? Oh, that's right. So at that point, there was no further date recommended. Oh, okay. Yeah, because someone was asking me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Is, is that about correct, Shelley? Do you think? Or? As, as far as I yeah. understand. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Richard would know better. Okay. Maybe yeah. Can, yeah. We can walk into that later. So we're still waiting for a date. So, um, Maureen. I see. That, um, are we going to have? Shelley, I don't know if you would be able to tell us. So we're going to have a presentation mid-June regarding wayfinding, wayfinding signage. Um, I'm not sure of the timing of that. If it's mid-June, I think uh, we come up next committee the whole next week. Um, and I know Al has been working hard with the consultant um, in getting stuff ready. Um, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you on the time. Okay. Yeah. Perhaps we'll say sometime. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we, we run out of meetings pretty yeah. quickly. <laughs> I, I know we do, yeah. I think that's what I'll say. All right, so mm -hmm. seeing no more questions, all those in favor? That's carried. And then we'll move on to planning report PR 18-4, extension of Comox downtown revitalization program, and that would be for adoption. With adoption? Second. And any questions, comments? Comes for you. We had some correspondence that just came to us there, and one of the suggestions was that uh, uh, postponing this until after the municipal elections in October. And I wonder if we should consider that. Hmm. Well, in my opinion, we've been doing this for quite some time, and it's just beginning to start to work for us. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that uh, we are trying to get our downtown more vital, more, more, more vitality in our downtown and have been for some years. And I think it would be uh, a mistake on Council's part to not continue on with this program just as it's starting to take steam. So that's my opinion. Anyone else? Well, I just uh, just to add that uh, perhaps a new Council that uh, uh, that's elected that, that may or may not be their mandate, I'm not sure. And uh, we're looking at a period of, what, five months, four months? I, I believe we review this every six months, so it, it wouldn't. Six months? 
wouldn't carry a huge mandate for a new council. Anyway, so. <coughs> yeah. it, it does take time for this to spark the imagination, and I, and I agree with you, Your Worship, that in fact, now we're really beginning to see results for all of this effort, and it, I, think it would be, I think it would be a mistake to stop at this point in time. Yeah, I, I agree, and I, I we only probably there's only what there's only the uh, development that we're going to be having the public hearing on that would really this would apply to at this point. Mm -hmm. So I think we should just leave it. Um, and, and yes, I was going to say, given that this is just looking at one more year, <laughs> it will be, as has been said, five months into the next term, and the review would come prior to that. And there is also a time that people have to get up to speed just to uh, look at you know, what it is about, the details, and then be able to make their own decision on that. So, um, yeah, I, I, I could see moving it forward. Okay. So, we have a motion on the table. All those in favor? And that's carried on. Opposed? I'm going to oh. beg the question. Okay, so that passes. And we'll then move on to uh, rezoning 14-8 cannabis regulation step two. And Marvin's going to give us a little dog and pony show here. Oh, to clear, oh. clarify if that was adopted by law. Oh, yeah. sorry. We did one. Okay. So we just adopt number one. We'll do number two then the Comox planning procedures amendment bylaw to be adopted. Second. And any discussion? And all those in favor? That's carried. And any opposed? You? There you go. He voted both times, but we know what you meant. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and then we'll move on to re, uh, rezoning 18-4 cannabis regulations uh, mm -hmm. step two. And if we can uh, have a motion to receive that. So moved. Second, and then Marla, you can do your thing. So the presentation is on RZ 18.4, which really gets into step two of the proposed regulations to allow for the retail recreational cannabis sale within the town. Right. So the outline. Um, first, I um, want to get into some background issues very briefly, then look at the regulatory options available to Council uh, before going into the proposed regulatory framework. Step one was completed with the adoption of Comox Zoning Amendment Bylaw 1880, and that prohibited the retail sale of recreational cannabis in the town of Comox. So the intent of that was to make it clear that um, recreational uh, cannabis sales was prohibited unless expressly permitted in by future bylaw amendments. And uh, those future bylaw amendments is really step two the regulations uh, framework that would be proposed for um, legalizing the retail sale of cannabis and how. Uh, regards to the federal and provincial regulations, just want to point out that the details of those are still evolving. I mean, the province uh, and, uh, has introduced uh, its act. Um, the regulations are still in process. So there's a certain degree of uncertainty. Um, and I fully expect that what we're going to see is the town and other municipalities that they choose to establish a framework for recreational cannabis, they're going to have to adjust that framework as more details become clear on the federal or provincial, and the implications of those regulations become clear. The options available to council really fall uh, on a continuum from increased flexibility and a corresponding increased uncertainty um, to the other side, the right side of the um, display, decreased flexibility, and a decreased uncertainty. Um, so if we're starting first in terms of where we have high uncertainty and but a lot of flexibility, that would be, first option would be, um, right here, it's to rely solely on provincial referral. So the, pro the provincial act has made it clear that uh, in order to sell recreational cannabis, you will require a provincial license. All, all applications for a provincial license will be referred to local government, and if local government recommends rejection, the license will not be issued. So that's one method of just um, reviewing these on a case-by-case -case basis and deciding whether or not to recommend approval or rejection. Um, the next was really taking that and adding a policy. So the, some municipalities are looking at then adding a policy framework, uh, saying proposed um, for um, how policy would address 
how the municipality proposed to allow um, such stores and any regulations. And then spot rezoning in conjunction with the referral from the province as they get applications. One thing to remember on this is the policy legally is non-binding. So council has to, if they receive a rezoning application, they have to decide that on its merits. They can refer to a policy, but essentially what they have to then do in that referral is say, does it apply in its entirety or only in parts in this one case before them? So they decide on its individual merits. When we start going into more, um, more certainty, then we start getting into um, zoning and business licensing regulations. The idea of enacting these prior to receiving applications for retail stores. Um, question often comes up, well, how's that going to work with the provincial referral? And um, what would happen is the province is going to do the referral. Um, municipality has zoning regulations, a business licensing regulations, and a, an application meets those regulations. The council has no obligation to recommend approval. So they still have, still have full discretion on that. But if they do recommend approval, and it is approved, then automatically the zoning regulations apply and the business licensing regulations apply. So you start to see something going from just straight policy to, hey, we've got the bylaws in. Um, this is sort of a framework that's got some, some real, um, a higher degree of certainty, really, what it comes down to. In reviewing these options, um, the key uh, that we identify is uncertainty. And the idea here is that it doesn't just affect business, it also affects the community. So we have uncertainty in regards to um, these retail stores. There can be unanticipated locations. There also can be um, unanticipated restrictions in terms of some people may have felt they would get a corner store and they don't. Right? Uh, for businesses, the more uncertain, the, the higher the risk um, uh, of an application rejection. Also, you start getting an opportunity for a competitive advantage and the risk of competitive disadvantage. What, what that means is if you have a policy and it sets certain restrictions, if you make an application and you're able to get an application approved that is more favorable than the policy, you have a competitive advantage over anybody else who came in in conformance with, the, with that policy. Um, on the flip side, if you come in and you apply in accordance with the policy, you're approved, and the next person gets more favorable terms, you're now at a competitive disadvantage. So it really starts creating a little incentive to push the boundaries. Um, and this uncertainty really becomes an issue for new controversial um, uh, uses such as retail cannabis, because there's a heightened concern uh, that the policy frameworks that they are put in place, that they're not going to be consistently applied. And we really saw that with phase one. Even though phase one, the report went out, it was the idea that this is the first step in allowing for the legal uh, retail sales. Overwhelmingly at the public hearing, there was this concern that, no, that's a, a bait and switch, that really the, the whole intent here is to prohibit retail sales. So given this concern over, over certainty, um, the proposed framework really focuses on the more certain aspects of establishing zoning regulations and business licensing regulations two sets of regulations. Um, focusing now first, I want to address the zoning. So the idea um, in looking in terms of establishing zoning regulations, we really followed a three-step process. And the first was to review existing commercial zones in relation to compatibility with recreational cannabis sales. Then we started identifying sensitive uses and minimum separations that stores should be from these uses. Um, and lastly, a minimum separation between recreational cannabis stores um, and the, uh, um, instituting a maximum store size. And this was really to get at the intent stated in the report in step one, which was this was to service local demand in a manner that does not promote its use, i.e. increasing demand for the product or trying to become somehow a regional sales center rather to serve local, the local area itself. So, um, just graphically um, walking in through the steps. So the first one is commercial zones. So the in red, showing our commercial zones within the town of Comox. Then what we did was we took a look and we said, well, okay, compatibility of use, this is a retail use, so what zones currently allow retail stores? Um, 
We also, the other concern that we had was ensuring um, if there's commercial zone property that's designated in the OCP for future re solely residential use, to exclude that. So that really ended up with two sites. We have the um, slight lumber site on Anderton, no longer shown in red, and the old motels here um, just east of the Anderton Comox intersection. They are, those are slated for uh, apartments. Okay, so that's off the table. Did you say those were off the table? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So they're no longer in red. Um, then what we looked at was, okay, where are the schools and uh, essentially Tinder 2. It's our largest daycare. Uh, with the idea of doing a separation of 150 meters from school um, and 50 meters from Tinder 2. The Tinder 2, really, the 50 meters falls within the um, 150 meter um, buffer or minimum separation of the school just north of the uh, fire hall, the Franklin Public School. Next sensitive use, um, we're now showing uh, properties in green and green shading. And those are um, parks with a significant playground feature. And there, um, that separation being shown there is 100 meters. So the resulting uh, lands shown in uh, red that aren't shaded are the ones um, where uh, retail stores would, would uh, it's proposed that they be permitted use. On this, um, I do want to stress that these boundaries are approximate. Um, you get things like the east third of the mall going in a circle radius in terms of the overlap with the 100, uh, 100 meter um, buffer from the, uh, neighbor, the park area to the east. Um, just a <coughs> tiny portion <coughs> of um, a scandal's lot included in the shading. So if this does make its way into regulations, we can rationalize that. I mean, there's no use in taking one meter of a lot <laughs> along a lot line and including it, or having a boundary along to a large lot like this that is very hard to define. So um, then we started looking at um, the local retail focus. So it's proposed as a maximum store size of 500 square meters, and that also corresponds to the limit of the reduced parking for, for retail. Any store size that goes above that has a much higher parking limit. Right? So that's really our larger, our larger service stores that, we're, that are above 500 square meters. And this shows a 250 uh, meter uh, minimum separation between Canada stores. When we start looking at separation between stores, a lot of how many potential store locations start is dependent on where, um, when you have a concentrated kind of large area like in downtown, it's commercial, where they, lo where they would locate. So here, if they locate more or less at the fringes, there's the maximum number of potential store locations. Three in the downtown, and you have three uh, at the um, Anarchy and Guthrie, have some outliers. So conversely, what we wanted to find out is what happens if somebody, the first person in, opens up a more central location? How does that restrict the allowance for, the, um, for other stores? So this one shows the minimum potential store locations. So you're seeing the downtown drop down to two, uh, similarly two um, in the Anderton Guide Corner. It's important to note that these are potential locations, they don't mean they're actual. Right? I mean, for a store to actually locate, first there has, to be, there has to be demand for their product within that surrounding area necessary to support them. In terms of the premise, uh, premises, it has to be available for rent uh, or for sale. It has to be suitable and the cost has to be right. Um, so the fact that there's multiple locations possible, that really means that there's some selection, very much like when people go and buy homes. You don't want to have just one house possibility in the entire town where you want to locate, you want to have a selection of, of, how, of homes or home sites so that you have some choice in terms of availability, right? what really suits your needs. So that's what this, um, the multiple potential store locations are getting at. Business licensing is really focused on the compatibility of use, ensuring the compatibility of use, the surrounding uses, and again, of that local retail focus, not the promotion of use. So when we're going, uh, not the promotion of use, uh, the proposed regulations include things like um, no externally visible display, advertisement, or promotion of cannabis or cannabis-related paraphernalia, limiting signs, um, references to cannabis 
to only the word cannabis, keeping the windows clear. So really what we want is an unobtrusive storefront. So, yeah, not this. Rather something like this. If it's a more clear storefront, you would have a simple one sign on the side. Uh, compatibility um, with uh, surrounding um, retail stores. The clear storefront would go a long way, but at the same time, um, we thought uh, other municipalities have, uh, have enacted um, provisions on security features, that there not be any roll down or other shutters on the exterior, and no bars within one meter of the windows and doors. It starts to make it look like a crime area. That, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Marvin, I went to the, um, at FCM, I went to the um, thing about getting ready for legalizing cannabis, and, and the city of Calgary did an, put an online application on, and they got 230 applications in 20 minutes. <laughs> and what they found was that many were putting in 20 and 30 applications all over town because it was like ours, it's limited to where you could go. So they tried to blanket as many as they could, hoping they'd get one or two. Yeah. It doesn't seem like a very good system to me. Um, what would we do in that case of, say, we've got basically nine, I think, locations? Somebody could come in, I guess, and try to get all nine, so they would be the only ones in town. Is, is there a way to combat that? Um, yes. The uh Part of it will be in the regulations themselves. What happens if you get multiple applications at the same time that are conflicting? Having very clear guidelines in terms of how that is determined and the processing that's determined. I mean, and council, at this time, still there's the province safeguard of application. So you can have an application come in. You can see who the applicant is. If it's the same applicant that you just approved the store on, then you can just say no on the grounds that they're just trying to secure a location and exclude somebody else. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. And are you familiar with the way Langford is doing theirs? Yes. Um, could you talk a little bit about that, or is that a good idea? I mean, it's interesting for sure. I, I can tell you what I know about it if you want, is that they've, they've gone out to uh, RFP. They've decided that they would have five of them in Langford, and basically their RFP says, what are you going to do for our community? And we want you to pay some of your profit back to us for some of the issues that we're going to come with. So an interesting concept. I'm not sure if that would be applicable here or not. Um, it's an interesting concept. I think you definitely run the risk of selling zoning, which is illegal. Um, I would say it's much more appropriate that if the town has certain things and they're worried about for example, policing or any other additional cost, could they actually just roll that into the business licensing? And that's what um, places that have higher costs, like the city of Vancouver's business license fee is. Do you know off the top of your head what that is? Around right? thirty thousand, I think. Thirty thousand. Yeah. Perhaps, right. And we're proposing. We don't think that. I mean, they had a. They have a lot. They're going in after the fact that you're trying to shut down existing stores, so they have a much harder thing. Right. We're not proposing a fee of any, anything in that, in that size. Um, that is the general advice that um, is out there. Okay. I believe Langford is the only one that is going Yeah, they, down. they would be going a different route because it's Langford, right? That's <laughs> what they do. <laughs> <laughs> and what about limiting the number? Is there some... Is there, is there an ability for us to say we only want two or three or five or whatever that number might be? Yes. So in your business licensing bylaw, you can say um, maximum of X, okay. if you so wish. Okay. Fair enough. And who else you? Go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure how this will all play out, but I know that uh, after hearing a presentation at the ABICC, that uh, we're in a, a good position and that we have sort of test cases from the states of Colorado and Washington as to what worked and what did, hasn't worked. And we're in a little bit better shape, better shape than perhaps uh, before it started, keeping in mind that there's a different uh, a federal political system, uh, uh, municipal and, and state systems down there. Um, but nonetheless, it's the, that uh, theme of over-regulation versus uh, allowing entrepreneurial uh, freedom, so to speak, within the, uh, uh, the rules and regulations. Uh, um, it's already been out there and tried, and there's some lessons. I understand that provincial 
uh, people have looked at and uh, have seen the pros and cons of. Uh, my uh, uh, question is, and this will, these are the indirect consequences that come out of uh, 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 regulations that are applied by municipalities, such as odors uh, that uh, uh, perhaps weren't thought of uh, originally, uh, uh, neighbors and uh, what rights do they have and how is that going to be enforced uh, um, and those type of things. I'm wondering if you're at a, a state already that you want to co uh, comment on indirect consequences of, uh, um, uh, of, of uh, enacting marijuana regulations uh, and usage and, and uh, within the town. There's definitely a concern uh, sort of in the literature of um, lack of competition. And so places that um, have artificial caps or even, even the issue of buffers because essentially you can locate and so then somebody can't compete and does that definitely reduces competition and how is that good for the end consumer or not. So that is, that is in the literature. Um, I mean, council would have the ability um, to uh, enact uh, business licensing maximums in terms of the number of stores, or they can also, um, if they were worried about the maximum number of stores, they can also simply recommend approval and then once they feel that they have enough, they can simply recommend that the next one, uh, the provincial referral, not be. So you can you can learn as you go under the current system. Um, the in regards to such items as odors, uh, I mean you have the odors are going to be primarily in terms of multi-tenant buildings um, and probably with residential above. Uh, so it's going to be um, if it will be. Um, property owners can put covenants on that say you can't have a use, regardless of what the zoning is. Um, there can also be strata regulations. Um, included uh, in the proposed regulations is um, odor, odor control, having odor control within these stores. Um, now, is that going to run afoul of um, the provincial prohibition on enacting a uh, building regulation? That isn't clear, um, but uh, since it's unclear and also since the provincial regulations on building regulations and what's in violation of the provincial regulations is evolving, um, that has been proposed to be included in the business license regulations. Because even if it's um, not permitted now, um, the province may, there's a lot of concern over these things, so the province may turn around and do an exemption from the building code regulations and these guys can regulate that. So I think Victoria has that in their regulations and uh, Vancouver does as well, doesn't it? Right? Um, no, they don't, just Victoria. Just Victoria has the odor control? Vancouver has a discretionary power to impose uh, odor control. Okay. Barbara. Yes, uh, and, and it's, it's really hard also in the atmosphere of actually not knowing clearly what the regulations coming down from senior governments can be. Um, I'm still not clear. If, if, say, we have 30 applications right off the bat, mm -hmm. um, how does that selection process comes about? I know you mentioned in the report uh, the lottery idea, but you know, didn't sound like it was a very feasible one. Well, yeah, I wouldn't recommend a, a lottery. I mean, there's, there's the newspaper example of the seven-year-old girl or whoever got, uh, got a lottery. You start then opening up yourself to people putting in applications on the idea of reselling it. Um, so I don't know what the beneficial part of that is. Um, the, the idea would be when you have these di separate distances, um, having a very clear cut in terms of how those, those buffers are made. And so um, also then in terms of the procedures by law, how applications are processed in terms of from the municipality right at the provincial referral. Right? Um, and council also has then the ability in terms of if you get 30 to turn around and say that's really nice and we let that all have them on the same agenda and we'll pick and we'll rank them. If council so wishes, on the individual merit of on the individual, I mean, deal with building. yeah, and, and council may turn since we have um, since we have that much interest right from the beginning, um, we'll select the five, 
three, whatever it, whatever they wish, that we see have the most merit at this time. Councilor Martin. Uh, I have more than thank you for this. this is, there's so much uncertainty here, it makes it very hard, so I don't know whether my question is premature or not, but, mm -hmm. but would the business licenses be charged the same for cannabis sales as they would be if I was opening a shoe shop? Uh, no, I believe that we would be for, we'd probably try to do it uh, consistent with liquor, liquor primary, liquor licenses, liquor stores. Oh, it would be, eh? I, I, just, I, I seem to recall reading somewhere that there's some communities that are that are asking a, a, a rather high license rate, such as $1,500, etc. We wouldn't consider doing something like that. Um, your licensing rate is uh, has to be directly um, related to cost, anticipated cost. So, I mean, if council felt that okay. there was a risk of uh, incurring increased policing costs, if right. there's a risk the of increased bylaw enforcement, mm -hmm. um, then they can adjust that fee. Okay, I see. At, the, at this point, that's sort of a comparable, right. and at least then council can evaluate that and say, well, okay, these are we have we do have liquor outlets in the town. Do we see this as causing more problems or less problems? And how do you wish, wish to address Fair that? Fair enough. Good. Thank you. Councillor Swift. Thank you. Um, just as you were talking, it, it suddenly occurred to me that we've been looking at these uh, types of shots that are kind of single use. Is there any anticipation that they could? Um, go into a 7-Eleven type arrangement and be sold at the Husky gas station, for instance, um, as part of the things that they sell in there? Have you anticipated that at all? Um, well, the um, federal provincial regulations are pretty clear that you can't co-sell um, with alcohol. Mm -hmm. So it can't, you can't have alcohol and that. Um, beyond that, um, at this point, we, we really didn't turn our mind to that. Um, as to if that would be an issue or not. Um, we could, uh, through the zoning bylaw, simply say that um, a retail store uh, put, in, uh, put in a regulation that says cannabis retail shall not be done with any other permitted use other than probably paraphernalia related. Or if the council wishes to even separate that, um, they, they would have the ability to do so. I, I'm not, I don't have a pin, strong opinion one way or other, but I'm thinking, oh, you can go to the town pantry and get your chips in. Your <laughs> <laughs> your but, but I mean, it's similar to how you can buy your uh, tobacco. So I know it's, it's new, so it just occurred to me with these yeah. models that we hadn't anticipated, or I hadn't anticipated <clears throat> another model. No, and I, and I think that's a very good point. I mean, all that we can do at this, the best thing that we can do at this point is, is look at references, right? And so far, the references, I mean, yeah, it's Vancouver and Victoria. Um, <laughs> those are standalone stores. Um, so um, I think that uh, based on that comment, unless there's objection from council, um, we want, um, if we do proceed to uh, uh, public open house on, on the framework, we would then include the restriction of these two solely the sale of recreational cannabis um, and uh, probably put in a maximum size on the as well and keep them within the 500 square meters. Because that's really, that, when Vancouver started to clean it up, I mean, because this is Vancouver, right? And you started getting a lot of advertising, a billboard sign, uh, street signs, uh, with little sidewalk signs, right? Sandwich signs and all those other things going on. When they started to clean them up, they started to fade into the background, and those are really um, the standalone stores, right? Limits the amount of activity going in, means that people um, who are going in for other purposes um, aren't going in there for that. Because there's also operationally the limit in terms of accessibility to minors. It's going to be an issue, even without that. But like I said, I think that that's a, that's a very easy uh, amendment to the framework and one that I would, I would be in favor of. Okay, yeah. I think it's, it's worth looking at, just yeah. similar to tobacco. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Go ahead, you. Uh, just a, uh, sorry, uh, one last question is that uh, have, have uh, you given any thought to how things like strata councils will deal with uh, uh, owners, uh, residents, um, 
having plants and number of plants and that type of thing in regards to nuisance and odors. And uh, my understanding, at least attending the AVICC workshop there, was that uh, um, that landlords uh, uh, will be able to control and uh, make decisions on uh, uh, in regards to that. Yeah, my understanding that is going to be addressed by provincial regulations. So that would be provincial regulations? Yes. Yeah, regarding to the stratas, um, that's going to be So would that be the same then, Marvin, for things like festivals and what we would do with people smoking pot at festivals? Another one that came up when I was in uh, Halifax was HR. What do you do with human resources as it applies to town employees and all of that that goes on? There, there's a lot more issues here. Human resources won't. I mean, uh, festivals, um, I believe that smoking is now, um, I guess you can, you can, there are areas that are prohibited in smoking. Um, and in terms of if council wishes to get into that in, you know, in an expanded way or in terms of in their permit issuancing, I mean, I really don't know what, at this time I'm not aware of any proposal on a provincial level uh, to have special occasion pot sales. Right, like you do with uh, uh, with a beer garden, right? But there's no proposal for that. Okay. Um, I think that that sort of thing is, is one of the things that even even regardless of the regulations that come out, a lot of it's going to be how is this actually dealing with in terms of these special events and how our property managers. And I think you're going to see some adjustment in that. In terms of the t items like employees, um, the uh, Employers are already dealing with this. Um, you have to, if you are uh, under the influence of any um, narcotic, um, anything that alters your ability to perform your job, you have to advise um, your employer. If you don't advise your employer, it's subject to, um, uh, it's even subject to termination, but uh, definitely in terms of um, there's rep repercussions for it. And that's in relation to medical. So even if you have a medical certificate to use it, you have you have to tell your employer. Okay. And then it's a matter of can that be accommodated? Can there be other things? Does that mean that you can't work? Or um, so it's not going to be uh, even worse than uh, or more restrictive for recreational. Okay. Yeah, it seems there's going to be lots of little periphery mm -hmm. things. I mean, I think of the four plants per house and bylaw enforcement, and neighbor on neighbor disputes, and I, you, know, you can see a whole litany of things that we're going to have to figure out as we go, but anyway, anybody else got anything else? Everybody's good. So we are talking about, uh, we did move and, and second an open house for June 14th between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. at the Comox Community Center. So all those in favor? And uh, opposed, so that's carried. That's June 14th, your worship? Yes. And we'll move on to special reports, Comox Valley Regional District uh, meeting minutes for receipt of May 15th. Move receipt. Second. Second. And discussion? All those in favor? Carried. And then we move to the Comox election and assent voting bylaw number 1888-2006 as amended. And we need first, second, and third reading. Second. And Shelby, did you? Did you want to speak here? Um, were you stretching or were you? Did you want to <laughs> <laughs> I thought I saw your hand. Come on. No, no, I'm good. Thank okay, you. so any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Let's carry. And we will now move on to correspondence. So, letter for receipt from K. Rusk, Simon Cycles, Yana Ride Committee. Move the receipt. And second. Second. And they are looking for, approve, for approval of what they're doing. So uh, I think we can do that. So all those in favor? That's carried. And Chris Morrison, opposition to the promenade extension for receipt. Second. Second. And discussion? I was sad to receive the letter. Yeah. I'm sorry that he feels that way. I feel that it, it's. Our, our promenade has been a big bonus to our waterfront, and I think this this additional little move outs are going to be maybe even better for everyone. I, I, I'm all in favor of it. Sorry, <laughs> sorry to see that better. 
well, it's a ways off yet, so okay, go ahead. Uh, just a question uh, for Shelley, perhaps. Is, is there going to be further uh, uh, opportunity for input, public input, into into that? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, that, that was my understanding. So, yeah, yeah. So oh, the, there okay. is still opportunity for uh, Yeah, that was just, you know, that was just, um, I think Al just put together an idea for us to say this could be a... Uh, something that we could think about for the waterfront down there as the next phase. So, so there'll be all many steps yet to go in that process. Uh, might I suggest then that uh, uh, that uh, person who sent that letter be replied to and given the date of that uh, uh, that opportunity for input? Can we do that? Please do that. Sure. <laughs> all right. All those in favor, receipt. And that's carried, and then we have Lee Everson from the Camagüey Cultural Society thanking us for our contributions for receipt. So moved. Second. And we'll send a logo. Yes. Yes. And do all of that. All those in favor of receipt. And that's carried. So we have no late items, blah, blah, blah. Down to the next item. Yeah, we'll go to the next item. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
leading it, and uh, they present and um, they present it. It was a strategic priority of the board in 2017, and they're going to talk individually to um, all of us and uh, the members of the Sewage Commission Water Committee. And um, you spoke with our staff today. So. Great, okay. yeah, directors and staff, and uh, care then and. Uh, and just um, see what comes out of it mm -hmm. and uh, start with the discussion. Uh, I attended a meeting of the Comox Archives and Museum Society and the open house for the uh, display of the town's proposed projects and the department information, which was great. I attended FCM and uh, it was a chance to hear from all the federal party leaders. Uh, there's some Great workshops, and um, let me just see. Okay, um, uh, heard of communities that are weaning themselves of fossil fuel as an economic tool. Energy costs using fossil fuels uh, sees all this money going out of the community. So investing in alternatives in the community, such as wind, solar, and hydro, uh, not only helps with climate change, it also keeps more of this investment in en energy in the local community. So another interesting way of looking at it. So it makes financial as well as environmental sense. <coughs> um, public transit and green infrastructure are a critical part of climate action. Uh, there is grant money out there and tools and programs to support uh, local communities in looking at local solutions for national climate outcomes and uh, FCM is a good source of these. I've got information to pass on if, you, if people want to talk more about it. Very challenging, uh, particularly for smaller communities that have limited expertise. Another thought-provoking workshop was Local Fiscal Tools for Canada's Future. Um, as we all know, we only have access to 10 cents of every tax dollar and uh, municipalities certainly make the most of these resources. However, we need to be finding other revenue sources. And um, I'm to know, please know, I'm uh, Ms. Gattries. Um, there was a sense that people were taxed enough and rather than finding new taxes to look at how we can uh, get more access to federal and provincial money, there was an interesting study in um, Newfoundland uh, where they looked at um, if 1% uh, of the taxes, provincial taxes, came to municipalities it would be, um, it would represent 23% of the budget and would only be a 1.5% loss to the province. So if there is ability to do those tax shifts, I've lost all my notes here, but, um, uh, and also um, percentage of sales, sales taxes, um, that has been, uh, that's been done in uh, Saskatchewan. So I think it's something that maybe we need to be doing more um, advocating for resolutions to ABICC, UDCM, because it does seem that in local hands, tax dollars are spent very wisely. And it was certainly stressed that un unconditional uh, grants of money are the most effective because we know how to use them. Um, Okay. I also went on the study tour of Trees at Work Services of Halifax's Urban Forest, and uh, that was fascinating. Um, interesting facts, um, a Japanese study shows people who live around trees live longer. The uh, bigger the trees, the better the services they provide, and, and not only um, uh, shade and separation from traffic and pedestrians, but also they've shown that uh, 
a town that lasts longer when it's shaded. So looking at broadleaf trees, they're the, the most effective. Um, diversity too, that uh, in Halifax they don't do more than 15% of any one species because if you have Dutch Elms disease or something comes through, then you can lose a lot of your uh, street trees. So uh, very important to, uh, to do that. And you'll all be very pleased to know, um, I did bring for everyone, it's just a real short um, uh, brochure, but it talks about all the value of trees and, and much more than I actually uh, thought of. And um, I think at Dalhousie University, they have, um, you know, because trees sometimes do have to go, uh, they have, that they actually don't just look at the number of trees, they look at the size of the trees. And, uh, and so they add up the whole, the, the uh, di diameter of all the trees being lost and replace it by two and a half times. So, um, yeah. It was, yeah, it was fascinating. Uh, great trade show. Um, I did bring some information. I've got to, uh, I'll give it to Richard when he comes back on um, a company that supports municipalities on getting the ownership of uh, projects when we have engineering projects, when we have uh, design criteria, uh, that design that we've paid for that uh, these can be resold and uh, for royalties. So I think it's certainly worth uh, looking at. And I brought uh, the clauses that you would need to be in, in, uh, incorporating. And then you can look at a return down the road from, from the work that you've done. Um, I also went on the tour of the new waste energy plant uh, in Chester, about just about an hour outside. Halifax, not running yet. Um, it, um, I mean, it all looked very sparkly and huge amounts of machinery. And, and, and I think you know the theory is good, and the um, uh, the it, it all goes into different processes and metals pulled out, and a lot of uh, of, of what comes out is plastic, these tiny little plastic chips which they make into a fuel. Um, the concerns are it's not running yet, and um, uh, there is a, a big push, I know, within my, the uh, Comox Strathcona Solid Waste Committee to move ahead right away. It does seem that there is still a lot of uh, 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 things that need to be worked out and uh, that concern about going into technology at the leading edge can be very expensive. And uh, it was very hard or uh, it, it, it was not possible in that context to even get an indication of what the cost would be. It, it, their project is based on private uh, investment in the plant and then paying a tipping fee. So uh, Russell Dyson of the CAO of the Regional District will be talking with them more to see if they, you know, get some figures tied down and, uh, and some idea of the contractual side. Uh, but I, I certainly have the sense that waiting until we actually see how these um, projects unfold. And also, um, I did ask him to look into it, it, I was curious as to why the whole area was not supporting this um, facility and why some of the communities have chosen not to go into it is also you know, great background information. And uh, yeah, great convention, met people from all over Canada, lots of ideas and contacts. And yeah, it was, it was fabulous. Excellent. Good report. All right, Mark, we only have, we have a... Oh, you have 30 seconds? Yeah, you have about 30 seconds. <laughs> we have an in-camera to go, and then we have a hearing, so away you go. I will be quick. Um, first of all, I did a quick follow-up for the on the water symposium that I had attended, but I won't go into that detail right now. I attended the town open house. Uh, oh, this is a little aside. Representative 
of a group of people from the North Island made their first visit to our marina. And that representative me, gave me a call to say how very, very pleased that they were and were excited for all the, all of the good things that are happening in the town, which is good news. I also attended KFN Council of the Council, uh, opening of uh, Liz Stubbs Cutting Garden and the Filbert Spring Showcase the AGM for Comox Valley Economic Development, and the Seniors Board. Did right. I do that in 30 seconds? You were one second over. Oh. <laughs> you know. And uh, I also attended the FCM. A couple of the noteworthy ones that I went to was working with industry and retailers to adapt, create, and innovate. And the basic message there was taxation, commercial taxation is uh, for retailers is really hard, especially for the small ones, and any time we can cut some red tape and make it a little easier for them, uh, that goes a long way with them. Uh, I also went to the Getting Ready for Legalizing Cannabis, and I think we talked about most of the things there. Uh, the Economic Development AGM, Utilities Commission yesterday, and I think all of the other ones you talked about uh, at the Regional District, so I did all of those too. So. With that, we have um, no media here, so they won't have any questions. Uh, questions from the public? No questions from the public. So if we could have a motion to exclude the public for to go to in camera, pursuant to section 127. Second. Second. All those in favor? Harry, we'll just give it a few minutes. Clear out. And Good. Well done.